Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and for my photography buying guide, I'd like to dive a little deeper into crop factor, as well as aperture, focal length, and ISO, and all the various problems with the system that we photographers rely on every day. Because the fact of the matter is, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it really breaks down when you start to compare images from different cameras with different sensor sizes. So let's get right into it. Up first, because I know not everybody watches the whole thing, here's a quick too long, didn't watch summary of it all. You want to multiply your focal length by your crop factor. You want to multiply your aperture by your crop factor, and you want to multiply your ISO by your crop factor squared. Also, don't trust Sony, Panasonic, and Olympus. You want more information about that keep watching and i'll fill you in first up a couple of myths that i plan to disprove small sensors are noisier just not true small sensors have less bokeh also not true a 12 to 35 f2.8 lens with a 2x crop is a 24 to 70 with an f2.8 crop not true we'll get into that if you haven't mastered the basics of shutter speed, ISO, and aperture, this will all be a little over your head because I'm going to go a little bit deeper than I usually do here. So be sure to watch my overview of shutter speed, ISO, and all these camera settings, as well as my overview of crop factors and why you need to apply it to aperture. Up first, I'm going to attack focal length. Let's look at some examples of what focal length does. Here we see two pictures taken at different focal lengths with the same camera. We have a picture on the left here at 100 millimeters and another picture at 200 millimeters. Now, let's look at another picture. This is two pictures both taken at 100 millimeters. This one suddenly is way closer. <laughs> Why is that? That doesn't make any sense. I took these two pictures with different cameras. On the left, we have a full frame camera and on the right, we have a micro four thirds camera. Micro four thirds camera has a smaller sensor. And at this point, focal length just breaks down for us. It just stops being useful. Why do we rely on focal length to identify our lenses when this simple unit of measurement doesn't work as soon as we put a different camera body on? It doesn't make any sense. There's better ways to do this. This is because the sensor size changed between the two different cameras. So let's look at what the different sensors look like. This biggest box here is a full frame sensor. Inside we have an APS-C sensor. Inside that, we have a micro four thirds sensor and then a CX sensor. Now here I've taken the liberty of just applying the crop factor to a bunch of different common focal lengths. So if you have a 24 millimeter lens on full frame, you can get the same field of view, angle of view, with an 18 millimeter because APS-C has a 1.5x crop factor. Micro four thirds very neatly has a 2x crop factor that makes the mat easy, so I'll be using that a lot. So a 12 millimeter focal length would give you the same 73 degree angle of view as a 24 millimeter lens. Let's move on. Here's a picture with the crop factor applied. So I took a picture at 200 millimeters on a full frame camera and at 100 millimeters on a micro four thirds camera with a 2x crop. And you can see Chelsea's about the same size in both pictures. These two pictures aren't quite exactly the same but the field of view is the same, the angle of view is the same. So we'll get into the differences in a moment. Now let's talk about ISO. I was able to find a little bit about the history of ISO. Uh, the predecessor was called ASA, and that dated back to 1943 when they kind of came up with these standards. But those ASA standards were in turn based on exposure meters that had been made in the 30s. So when we're talking about ISO, we're talking about like an 80 year old standard that was developed for film emulsions. It was developed to measure film so that people could switch films and know what their exposure should be. Now we're dealing with digital sensors that just behave completely differently. And you'll see ISO really breaks down. It's really not a very good unit of measurement. And if I could get rid of ISO and do something different, I definitely would. I don't expect ISO to be going anywhere anytime soon, even though it's not a logical way for us to measure our sensors behaviors. So I'm going to teach you how to deal with it and how to compare ISOs across different sensor sizes. Real quickly, pause the video and read this if you want. But I want to say ISO is not an acronym. It is not ISO. It is based on the Greek word ISO. So that's why I say ISO because that's what the organization calls themselves. This is from their website. 
To demonstrate the effects of changing your ISO, I've taken three pictures with the same camera at different ISOs. On the left here, we have ISO 200 taken at 1 30th of a second in the middle, ISO 1600 taken at 1 250th of a second. And over here on the right, we have ISO 12,800, very high ISO taken at a very fast shutter speed of 1 2000th of a second. So you can see that changing your ISO does two different apparent things. All these pictures have basically the same brightness. So the exposure stayed, stayed the same despite the fact that I changed the shutter speed. Therefore, we can conclude something we already know, that a higher ISO makes your camera more sensitive to light, basically. It takes less light to make a picture of the same brightness. You'll notice something else. On the far left over there, ISO 200 looks pretty good. I, I took a picture of a white wall. And if you let the camera auto expose itself, that white wall will turn gray. So we have different just gray here. But the left gray is nice and pretty smooth. The middle gray has more grain to it. You can see lots of little bumps and changes. And the right side, quite noisy. It doesn't look smooth at all. And that's because over on the right here, the camera had less light to try to make a picture out of. It just had less signal. And that changed the signal to noise ratio. And let's take a look at that. This is the mathematical formula for the signal to, to noise ratio. And I'm using P here to represent the amount of photons. Basically, it's P divided by the square root of P. And what this yields is if, if you have, if P is very low, let's say P was 1, you'd be dividing P by the square root of P, 1 divided by the square root of 1 is 1. So you'd have 1. You'd have a signal to noise ratio of 1. You'd have as much noise as you did light and signal and you would have an exceptionally noisy image. If you were to make P100 by adding a whole bunch more light, well, you'd have 100 divided by the square root of 100, 100 divided by 10. And that would yield a signal to noise ratio of 10. So basically, if you were to increase the number of photons, you'd be decreasing the noise by a factor of 10. That's great, right? That means the more light we get, the cleaner our images are going to be. So if we go back to the previous side, slide, we can imagine that this slide over here, this picture on the right, didn't have very much light because it got really noisy. This is something really important to understand about ISO. ISO cranks up the appearance of any light that it can receive, but it still has to work with whatever light the lens passes to it. Now let's think about how ISO and sensor size work together. I'm going to go back to my sensor size slide. ISO measures light per square inch or square millimeter, basically per a unit of two-dimensional area. The full frame sensor here, therefore, gathers more total light than the smaller sensors do, just like a small bucket would gather less rain than a big bucket in a rainstorm, right? Because the rain is kind of coming down evenly everywhere a smaller sensor is going to gather less light. However, you don't see any difference in the exposure. Here we see three different pictures with three different cameras, all taken at the same ISO. You can see that they're all basically the same brightness. ISO amplifies the amount of light that it receives to achieve a particular brightness as expected by those old, old 80-year-old ISO standards. And it makes no difference what size sensor you are, it's going to get back to that same level of brightness. But this is where things start to break down with ISO because these are all taken with the same ISO, but you can see they, they give the same brightness, which is good, but they give very different results with the amount of noise. The full frame sensor over there on the left creates a very clean image. The APS-C sensor here with a 1.6x crop factor, substantially noisier, just look at the difference there. And then 2x, an even smaller sensor, you can see it's, it's quite a bit noisier than either of the other two. And that's because, looking back at this slide, it's a smaller sensor. There's the, the, the red box here is the one that was on the right, and the green box was in the middle, and the blue full frame sensor was on the left. The bigger sensor has a cleaner image because it's able to gather more light. This seems really obvious, but in my first crop factor video, this was a constant point of confusion. People thought an APS-C or a micro four-third sensor were receiving the same total amount of light because they took pictures at the same brightness when they used the same ISO. 
but the ISO is kind of has a codependent relationship with the sensor size. The smaller sensor is not gathering enough light, so ISO is over there like, shh, don't worry, I'll just crank it up for you, I'll just amplify everything. And that does allow us to use the same settings on a full frame camera or a micro four thirds camera, but it doesn't allow us to take the same pictures. Because the smaller sensor is getting less light, we end up with noisier sensors. And this is what leads people to wrongly believe that smaller sensors are inherently noisier. They're really not. Let's look at another picture. This is three pictures taken with three different cameras. And you'll notice right away, they're all about the same brightness. You'll also notice that they have about the same noise levels. What I did for this set was I took pictures using the same total amount of light. Now, again, if you forget that ISO is something meaningful, if you take it off of its throne and instead just manipulate it so that each of the sensors gets the same light, then you can see they produce about the same picture. Small sensors are not actually noisier if you give them a fair amount of light. <laughs> we have been starving our small sensors this whole time because we've been using this 80 year old ISO standard which measures light fall based on square inches. Why do we do that? <laughs> Why don't we measure the total light that falls on the entire sensor instead? Because that's what we care about. We care about how our picture looks, not about how much light is falling on each inch of sensor, because we're not dealing with film emulsions anymore. Every camera can have a different size sensor if we can disregard the way that ISO works. Now you can see what I did here on the full frame camera on the left, I set it to ISO 1600. On the APS-C camera on the, in the middle, I set it to ISO 640. And on the Micro Four Thirds camera, I set it to ISO 400. Now I'll explain the math here. This is my crop factor for ISOs. It is basically just the regular crop factor squared. So if you have a full frame camera, of course, there's no multiplying that you need to do. If you have an APS-C camera and you want to find out how you can get the same amount of light as a full frame camera and thus get the same image quality, you multiply the ISO by 2.3x. It's 2.6x for Canon APS-C because for some reason they use slightly smaller APS-C sensors than the whole rest of the world. Micro Four Thirds, uh, normal 2x crop factor, square it, it ends up 4x. And then if you have like a Nikon mirrorless camera, uh, the smaller form factor ends up at a 7.3x crop factor for ISO. Now in this slide, I've taken the liberty of showing you how different ISOs compare for different cameras. So I'll jump down a little bit. If you take a picture at ISO 800 on a full frame camera, you'll end up with about the same amount of noise as if you took a picture at ISO 200 on a micro four thirds camera. So if you're shooting, if you're accustomed to shooting a full frame camera and you know you get pretty clean images at ISO 800, just make a mental note and set your micro four thirds camera to ISO 200 and you will get the same picture. It won't be any noisier. We're not cheating here. Instead of keeping ISO constant, we decided ISO sucked, right? Because it's old and outdated and based on film. Instead of keeping ISO constant, we're keeping the total light gathered constant. And to allow us to easily math that, we are squaring the crop factor and using that to multiply the ISO. Smaller sensors are always going to need a lower ISO to gather the same amount of light. If a micro four third sensor is one quarter the size of a full frame sensor, that's about right. Obviously it's going to have to gather four times more light just because the surface area is smaller. If you put a bucket that was four times smaller out in the rain, you'd have to leave it out in the rain four times longer. Or you'd have to have it rain four times harder. <laughs> Either way, you'd end up with the same amount of water. And that's what we care about, the total amount of light. Not whether or not the arbitrary 80 year old ISO is equal. Who cares about that? That's just, it, it unfortunately is built into every camera and we're all familiar with it. But it's not that meaningful of a constant and it's not the constant we should use when we're comparing different cameras. Small sensors are noisier. It's just not true. What we can say is, Small sensors are noisier if you don't adjust the ISO. If you're keeping the ISO constant, yes, it'll seem like small sensors are noisier, but small sensors have similar noise when you give them similar light. Just give them the same total light. It's what they need. It's what cameras need is light, not 
ISO and aperture and all that. They just need more light and you'll get nice clean images. Now let's talk about aperture and depth of field. Here we see two pictures at f2.8 and f5.6. These are taken with the same camera. We can see some differences here. They, they look pretty much the same, and if you weren't looking closely, you might not notice a difference, but look at the background here. Here we can see the walls and this part of the, uh, the window frame. Here it's very blurred, and over here it's not nearly as blurred. This image taken at f5.6 has more depth of field. That means the background is sharper. At f2.8, everything is blurred a little bit better. The other difference you'll notice is I, I kept the shutter speed the same, but I shot this one at ISO 800 and this one at ISO 3600. I had to increase the ISO. I had to make the sensor more sensitive to light because at f5.6, I'm getting one quarter of the light, two stops less light. So I had to raise the ISO by two stops, or this would have been a darker picture. Pretty basic exposure stuff. Now let's take a look at basically the same pictures, but taken with two different cameras. This is a full frame camera, and this is a micro four thirds camera with a 2x crop factor. They're both taken at f2.8 and ISO 800. So right away, same shutter speed too. You can see the brightness is the same. These crop factors don't affect your camera settings but your camera settings are kind of arbitrarily mean and meaningless and based on these old film standards, right? <laughs> they do, however, affect basically every aspect of your image quality. You can see, if you look at this bar right here, it's not very blurred at f2.8 on the micro four third sensor. It's very blurred over here. That's because the full frame camera has a bigger sensor and your depth of field is determined by both your f-stop number and your sensor size. So when we use a smaller sensor with the same f-stop number, you get more depth of field. You get less light, but more depth of field, and therefore the background is more in focus. We can adjust for this by applying the crop factor to the aperture, and that's what I've done here. I set the full frame camera to f5.6, and as you can see, if you look at the background, now we have about the same blur on both cameras. Because I raised the f-stop number on the full frame camera, I also had to raise the ISO or the picture would have gotten darker. So I switched to ISO 3200 and f5.6 and then f2.8 and ISO 800 on the 2x crop factor camera. Well, that's interesting, right? Because earlier when we were discussing ISO, I mentioned that you had to adjust it by the square of the crop factor. So 2x squared would be 4x, 3200 divided by four, is ISO 800. So by applying the crop factor to the f-stop and the square of the crop factor to the ISO, I ended up with identical pictures. Theoretically identical pictures. Okay, there's some differences in sensors and lenses and technology and stuff between different platforms. But in theory, with similar sensors and similar lenses, you would end up with the same picture. Meaning the sensor size itself doesn't make any difference to the outcome of the picture. What does make a difference are your use of these kind of old settings. So that's why I say we need to learn to cope with these settings. All you have to do is apply the crop factor appropriately and you can get exactly the same image with small sensors. Here I've created a little grid for you, another conversion grid showing common f-stop numbers. You can see that f2.8 on a full frame camera if you wanted to simulate both the same total light and the same depth of field on an APS-C camera, you'd have to set it to f1.8. If you wanted to go to micro four thirds, you'd need f1.4 because f2.8 divided by two is f1.4. If you're using one of these tiny CX sensors, you're gonna need some really, <laughs> really fast lenses in order to simulate the same depth of field and total light gathered as you would on a full frame camera. Now at the top here, I've also set, just as an example, equivalent ISOs, and we covered that earlier, but ISO 800 and F2.8 will give you about the same exposure as ISO 200 and F1.4 on a micro four thirds camera. Well, not just the same exposure, it will be the same brightness, but it will also have identical depth of field and identical total light gathered. Therefore, you should expect to see similar noise levels. Again, small sensors aren't noisier, as long as you give them the same amount of light 
And this grid shows you how to give different size sensors the same amount of light, and that's what they need. So here's a myth, small sensors have less bouquet. No, small sensors have less bouquet if you don't adjust the f-stop. Small sensors have the same depth of field with the same total light and the same field of view. Let's do some math. <laughs> don't worry, I'm not gonna go on too long about this, but I wanted to show you the formula for determining aperture. It's f, which is the focal length of the lens. Again, I hate focal length, but it's built into the definition of aperture. D is the diameter of the iris of the lens. That's that opening at the front of the lens. It's not really the same thing as the opening of the aperture. Equals N. So this will make some more sense with an example. If you have a 100 millimeter lens and a 25 millimeter front opening, then you'll end up with a 100 millimeter F4 lens. It's just 100 divided by 25, pretty straightforward. Look at a real world example, the Nikon, 24 to 70 f2.8, an amazing lens. 70 millimeter focal length at the long end has a 25 millimeter iris, an opening at the front. You divide that out, you come up with f2.8. Works great, right? Here's another lens, this one that I have here attached to my GH4, the Panasonic 12 to 35 f2.8 at the long end of the zoom. It's 35 millimeters. It has a 12.5 millimeter opening at the front, yielding an f2.8 aperture. Well, let's look at some marketing material for this lens. This is where things start to get interesting. You can see here, they're advertising it as a 12 to 35 millimeter lens, and then they say 35 millimeter camera equivalent, 24 to 70 millimeters. Okay, that makes sense, right? We did that math earlier, but they forgot to apply it to the aperture. So they just say maximum aperture f2.8, and they don't mention the 35 millimeter camera equivalent. Well, let's just plug that into our formulas and see how that works out. We're applying the crop factor here, 70 millimeters. The front opening, of course, doesn't change. It doesn't, it would have to physically get larger to let more light in, but we are adjusting the, the focal length to adjust for the angle of view being different. But that doesn't add up. That doesn't divide out to f2.8. Instead, what does divide out correctly is f5.6. I'm doing this to provide mathematical proof for the idea that you cannot adjust the focal length by the crop factor without also adjusting the aperture by the crop factor because the aperture is defined by the focal length. If you change one, you have to change the other. We all learn this in like second or third grade algebra. You can't change one side of the equation without changing the other or it doesn't add up anymore. It breaks everything. Focal length is inherently part of the aperture. They are constantly connected and you cannot separate them. You can't apply the crop factor to one without the other or you break math. But this is a thousand dollar lens. So surely people who are buying a thousand dollar like professional quality lens, I love mine, it's a great lens. Surely people who are buying it know what they're getting. They're not being misled by the fact that it's kind of advertised as a 24 to 70 f2.8 lens, right? So I looked at some Amazon reviews. This is from the top review on Amazon. Unreal for 24 to 70 f2.8 and the size, weight, cost, and quality. Who wouldn't want to carry a lens of this type in their coat pocket? I would love to carry a 24 to 70 f2.8 in my coat pocket, but they're really big and heavy. However, a 24 to 70 f5.6, even for full frame, could be pretty small. So you can see if you didn't do the math on the aperture, then you'd kind of be misled, and I, I feel really bad for this guy because he thinks he's getting a 24 to 70 f2.8. He didn't. Here's another review. It's a marvel to get a 24 to 70 field of view with an f2.8 into this size. It's, just, it's not a marvel. <laughs> That's how big a 24 to 70 f5.6 lens would be. It's how big a 12 to 35 f2.8 lens would be. But it's much smaller than a 24 to 70 f2.8 lens would be because it doesn't have that big iris. It doesn't have that big opening. It can't gather the same light. Therefore, it's gonna produce noisier images and it's going to give you more depth of field, less 
of that pleasing background blur that photographers so often go after. It's not the same. This is the micro four thirds version of the common 24 to 70 f2.8 lens that's found in most professional kits. These are all from five star reviews on Amazon. So the people are happy with their lenses, but they paid a thousand dollars and they didn't get what they were, what they thought they were getting. I feel terrible for them. Shame on Panasonic for marketing the lens like this. Here's a comment I found in one of the reviews. This is refreshing. It's somebody who understood and did the math. And this is from a couple of years ago. In actuality, it's only as good as a 24 to 70 f 5.6 lens. I recently picked up the Tamron 24 to 70 f 2.8. That's a full frame lens that we reviewed and I love it. I picked up that lens for about the same price. So it's very hard to justify getting this now. Thank you. That's my nerd here. <laughs> this guy knew how to do the math. He understood the physics of it. And he applied that crop factor to both the focal length and the aperture. And you know what? He got the lens that he wanted for the same price because he did the math correctly. Now me, I still got the 12 to 35. I like this lens. So a myth, a 12 to 35 f2.8 with a 2x crop is a 24 to 70 f2.8 false. A 12 to 35 f2.8 with a 2x crop is a 24 to 70 f5.6. Or you could say a 12 to 35 f1.4 with a 2x crop is a 24 to 70 f2.8. So how about it, Panasonic, Olympus? How about making me a 12 to 35 f1.4 so I can for reals have my 24 to 70 f2.8 equivalent and get the same clean images and the same background blur? You know why they haven't done it so far? Because people don't know. They just don't know that they're supposed to apply the crop factor to the aperture. They don't understand the effects on total light gathered. And it's because we use this antiquated system of ISO and f-stop. That system's not going away, but you can learn how to understand it and how, to, how those settings impact your actual pictures. I have some more examples. Some can camera manufacturers are really naughty. <laughs> They're being really deceptive. It's bad. This is the Sony RX10. It comes with an 8.8 .8 to 73.3 millimeter f2.8 lens. Sounds pretty good. It's a decent camera. If you put that into 35 millimeter terms, it becomes a 24 to 200 millimeter f7.6 lens. The problem is how they advertise it. Here we can see the Amazon page. Bright f2.8 Zeiss Vario Sonar T lens, 24 to 200 millimeters. That's not all. This is a quote from Sony. A large f2.8 maximum aperture throughout an expansive 24 to 200 millimeter zoom range gives you depth of field to defocus backgrounds. Because they know people want to shoot at 200 millimeters f2.8 because we're all used to seeing those headshots that blur the background so nicely. Look at this picture. This is from the Amazon page too. This is their RX10. And in the background, they've superimposed their 70 to 200 f2.8. You're telling me that they're not trying to imply that this takes the same pictures as the 70 to 200 f2.8. We know it doesn't. We looked at the examples. We did the math. Here are some quotes from reviews. It's like having the 24 to 70 and 70 to 200 millimeter f2.8 big camera lenses all packed into this tiny form factor. It's not though. This guy spent like 1500 bucks on a camera and he didn't get what he thought he was getting. He got tricked. He's dreamed of getting the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200, and he thought he could get the best of both worlds. He thought he could get all that in one tiny little pocketable camera. And you can't. The physics aren't there. You need a big iris at the front. That's why those lenses are so big. There's no escaping it. You need lots of photons entering. You need something to capture that light. You can't get around the physics of it. But the marketing department tries and they do trick some people and it's it's awful. It's better than using my pro cameras. And then this guy lists all <laughs> a bunch of pro cameras. They didn't even list them all. He just listed like $100,000 in camera gear more than that. You are getting the 24 to 70 f2.8 and 70 to 200 f2.8. So here's somebody who considers themselves an expert in camera gear and they do know about crop factors, but they only think they, they think they only have to apply it to the focal length and not the aperture. The guy got scammed. I bought it for the f2.8 f-stop throughout the 24 to 200 zoom range. 
But if you convert the focal length and not the aperture, you break math. It's not just Sony though. Here's the Olympus Stylus One, another fixed lens camera. It has a six to 64 millimeter F2.8. Oh, like 10X zoom, that's pretty sweet. Look how they advertise it. Ultra slim, 28 to 300 millimeter F2.8. They don't even bother putting an asterisk there. They just tell you the 35 millimeter focal length and then the f-stop number of the tiny sensor. I did the math for you. It's equivalent to a 28 to 300 millimeter f13. They're deceiving people. You can also see it from the imagery that they used. Here's the camera and then they put the shadow of the full size camera because this is how large a lens has to be to be 300 millimeters f28. And there's no getting around it because the front element has to gather light. You can't make it that, that small and gather the same amount of light as that. So you have to make a compromise. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Panasonic FC200 comes with a 4.5 to 108 millimeter f2.8. Well, it's like a 20 times zoom, right? Look at the way they mark it on the lens itself. f2.8, 25 to 600 millimeters. <laughs> Do you know how big a 600 millimeter f2.8 lens would be? It would, it would be 15, 20 pounds. <laughs> it, it would be massive. Actually, if you want to put it in 35 millimeter terms, it is a 25 to 600 millimeter F16. So try getting your sports shots at 600 millimeters and F16, because F16 isn't letting in enough light to freeze the action. Even at a high ISO, it's just not going to work. Nobody shoots sports at F16. Nobody shoots wildlife at f16 you just cannot get enough light therefore they're cheating people people who want a 600 millimeter f28 they're not going to be happy with their pictures and here's the bigger impact uh, sure panasonic has their money so good work panasonic but you've killed somebody's love for photography because they're going to go out and try to take those wildlife and sports pictures and they're not going to get the results that they've seen fuji i took a picture with a canon camera and a Fuji camera. And if you look at the little settings down here, you can see they're both taken at ISO 400, F5.6, 1 30th of a second. But notice that the histogram for the Canon camera is farther to the right than the histogram for the Fuji camera. Why would the Fuji camera be so much darker than the Canon camera? Because Fuji cheats. They downrate their ISOs. Therefore, uh, ISO 115 on your Canon camera comes up as about ISO 200 on your Fuji. This means that at ISO 100, your Fuji is going to have to keep the shutter open for longer than your Canon camera would, even at the same aperture and the same ISO. You know what's going on, right? The Fuji is just gathering more light. It needs that light to make clean images. So they cheat the ISO a bit to trick you into giving it more light. And therefore, if you compare its ISO performance at ISO 100, to any other camera at ISO 100, the Fuji is going to be cleaner because it's gathering more light. But it's not doing it by physically gathering more light, it's doing it by lying to you about what a given ISO is. So I've talked a lot about companies that are doing bad things, but I want to go over a few companies that are doing things right. And first of all, I went over Sony, Panasonic, Olympus, and, and how they're misusing crop factors by applying it to the focal length but not the aperture and therefore tricking consumers. I could not find any examples of Nikon, Canon, or Fuji doing that. So thank you guys for just being honest. They just don't do it because they know better and it's dishonest. And well, it might hurt their DSLR businesses too, but <laughs> nonetheless, I, I liked what they were doing. I'd also like to shout out to Metabones who makes these speed boosters that are basically reverse teleconverters. And what they do is they, if you're adapting, say, a full frame lens to an APS-C camera, they take that full image size and then shrink it down to the sensor. So normally, so you don't have a crop anymore because it just reshapes the incoming light from the lens to perfectly match that of your sensor. If you want to check out uh, the Metabone Speed Boosters, go to scp.io slash booster. They're brilliant. And they prove that you can get full frame equivalent results with smaller sensors. You just need the right optics. So why do you have to get a stupid speed booster and use a full frame lens? Well, a big part of it is that camera manufacturers just aren't making fast lenses for smaller sensors because we're not doing the math. Give us some native lenses <laughs> for smaller formats so we don't have to use a stupid adapter.
I also want one of my favorite lenses in the world. And my absolute favorite lens for APS-C is the Sigma 18-35 f1.8. I did a whole review on it. It's what kind of started this whole controversy. It's, it's an amazing lens. It's an APS-C zoom with an f1.8 aperture. And it, you know what? It's as big as a full frame lens because it has to be because it has to have a big iris at the front to gather all that light. But it will turn your APS-C lens into basically full frame quality. And it's brilliant for that. And any small sensor can give you full frame results with the right lens. So they have it for Canon, Nikon, and I think Sony uh, APS-C cameras. Check it out and you will be able to get full frame results. It comes at full frame prices. I think it's like 900 bucks. Uh, for more information, go to sdp.io slash 18 art. I also want to say hi to Voigtlander. <laughs> I love your super fast micro four thirds lenses. They aren't quite what you'd hope, but they're good. They have a 25 millimeter f0.95 and a 42.5 millimeter f0.95. This finally gives you a 50 millimeter f1.9 equivalent or an 85 millimeter f1.9 equivalent. That's great because those are focal lengths and apertures that I love on full frame and I've been missing them on micro four thirds. You can be the hero too. I want you to do a few things for me. Whenever you do the math on the focal length, do the math on the aperture too. And if you see people doing the math just on the focal length and not the aperture, just politely remind them that they need to apply both or they break math. Um, I would also appreciate it if you just help educate others by sharing this video. Or maybe you find some better source that you want to share. I don't care how people learn as long as they learn because I want people to no longer be cheated and I want camera manufacturers to start making lenses that give our small sensors cameras the light that they need. I hope you found this discussion useful. It's part of my photography buying guide. Just like stunning digital photography, I plan to update it for the rest of my life and it has a ton of in-depth material about camera gear, lenses, flashes, studio lights, uh, just about everything that you can imagine. It's at a great price too. You can get the ebook for under 10 bucks and it can save you thousands of dollars. Little things like this, like people not doing the math right, I address all of that so you won't get tricked by those kind of sleazier camera manufacturers out there. Thanks so much. If you want more free videos, click subscribe. We make new videos every week. Also check out our live show every Monday at five o'clock Eastern time. And if you have a question, just add a comment down below. Thanks.